Kevin Menegas is a puppeteer and the owner of the Fratello Marionettes, a puppet company that has been producing timeless marionette shows since 1989. He's also the co-author of the book, A Century of California Puppetry, How the West Was Strung. I talked to Kevin about his career, what drew him to marionettes, his work restoring puppets, and much more on this episode of Under the Puppet. You're listening to Saturday Morning Media, and now, back to our show. Welcome to the show that is preserving puppetry through the personal stories of professional puppeteers. My name is Grant Pachoco, and this is Under the Puppet. Kevin Menegas, welcome to Under the Puppet. Thank you, Grant, for having me. Pleasure to talk to you. Uh, I am from San Francisco Bay Area myself. That's originally where I grew up, so it's good to talk to someone else who uh, grew up in the Bay Area. Um, on your website, you mentioned that you got your first puppet at the age of six. Can you tell us that story and how that might have influenced uh, where you are now? Well, I got a little toy marionette of a Pelham puppet uh, farmer marionette for a, a birthday present. Um, and I grew up in uh, Michigan. I was born and raised in uh, little suburbs of Detroit. And uh, so being an only child and being cold winters in Detroit and <laughs> having to be- entertain yourself, uh, my dad built a little stage. And uh, that's how I really got started making puppet shows for my friends and my neighbors. Um, and then when kind of when I was really took took a, took a shine to puppetry and marionettes, my parents gave me another little marionette for, you know, next holiday or something like that. And I soon had a little cast uh, and I could really um, do my own little productions, really. Um, and I always found that I really liked the quality of Pelham puppets. Um, they're an English made, uh, handmade uh, toy marionette that were actually started in the late forties by Bob Pelham. And um, I, I really like that they're even handmade to the, when they were still being manufactured into the nineties, but uh, they're kind of a, uh, a, have a very long history of, of puppets. And it sounds like your parents were uh, very supportive of, you know, promoting this passion for puppetry in you. Yeah, they certainly helped uh, get me going um, but along with the, the farmer and they, they kind of figured that I really liked working with it. So they picked up a little Helen Fling, uh, a little 1980s um, uh, you know, marionette book that was out at the same time. And um, that I loved. I would go through that all the day and, you know, just look at all the drawings so that I have these really cool kind of Art Deco stylized uh, drawings from the 40s. And I just love the way the book was put together, even though it's very simple kind of concepts in making puppets, you know, um, you know, stuff that I use to this to the day for sure. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Uh, did you try to start building puppets back then at, at that uh, young age? It took a little bit longer, um, even though um, I kind of have this, my family kind of has a history of, of making things. Like my grandfather, he was a woodworker and um, he had many wood shops in his garage and in the basement and he was making furniture and stuff. And uh, so there's always a lot of wood tools around. My father didn't quite do that. He was an engineer. That's where we lived in Detroit. He was an engineer through a um, car company. So it was always great to have, um, but there was always tools around. So you could always had, you know, wood and could kind of, kind of make things. And I kind of started making my, my, I was spending some summer with my, uh, cause I, my family is all from New Jersey. You know, I'm from Detroit area. All my family's from New Jersey. So, they would kind of cart me off into the summers after school's over. And uh, I'd be kind of shuffle around all the families there. And one summer I was spending some time with my grandfather and uh, I was uh, I found these two dowels in you know, the basement. I said, oh, I can make some limbs out of that. I made a little real simple figure out of limbs and, uh, you know, some steel wool hair and some like, you know, took some uh, just some rags and made a little costume on a little puppet. And, you know, he was like horrified. He'd like, oh, that that was his little dowels that he used to make this, you know, special tool to make circles and stuff like that. And I was like, <laughs> okay, I guess I can't use all of his tools and all of his wood. So, yeah. So puppets getting you in trouble uh, yeah. from the beginning. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. And my grandfather, who he actually, besides being a woodworker, he also built a lot of machines and tools. So se- several of the sanders and drill presses that I have in my workshop, um, that he built himself. So we use it to this day for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Passing it down. Absolutely. Were you uh, at a young age, were you interested in puppets on like television or in movies? Did you have favorites uh, watching TV? 
I did. Um, I yeah. My my parents always like to say that we had when the Muppet Show was on, we had to have dinner in front of the TV on Sunday nights so they could actually watch the Muppet Show in the eighties. But um, I when I was growing up, um, going to elementary school, um, there is actually a marionette show that would come every year, kind of like the same thing that I do now. Um, just come and entertain shows now named Ed Johnson. He had a little dragon um, called uh, Applesauce the Dragon. And uh, he did one man marionette show. It was very ambitious, very cool proscenium with lighting. You know, he had it was a very cool production. Um, and I remember we kind of had to go backstage to get to our classroom after the performance. You could actually see his, you know, small stage and his setup and everything. So I was really, int- even though I had my little Pelham puppets, um, I was really intrigued by seeing his uh, marionette show every year. Actually, I have. Because I'm a collector as well, I have several Ed Johnson puppets in my collection here that I have. So I'm very proud to have some some of his work in my collection. That's awesome. Now you had this stage and you had these puppets. Um, I know that you you started Fratello Marionettes pretty early on, right? Yeah, it's been around for a long time. Officially in 2000, um, after I graduated college, um, but it's been around. I mean, I've been performing kind of professionally before that under kind of a, another name called the Puppet Troupe. And uh, oh, okay. And, but 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 Fratello was kind of formally assembled in 2000. Yeah. Yeah, I just I had read. Um, I think 1989. You like it was that when you started doing shows or, and things like that. Yeah, 1989. I moved from Detroit area to California and uh, was kind of really you know involved in the puppetry community here. Um, I did have a really great experience um, when I was in Detroit area. Uh, besides seeing a Johnson marionettes, um, I got to kind of know. This woman who did mall shows, her name was uh, Sarah Jackson. Her and her husband did these these marionettes, and they would travel doing mall shows. Kind of open. Um, they didn't have prosceniums, but they had an open space uh, uh, staging. But very cool. I was I had to drag my parents to go see uh, these shows in malls around Michigan. Uh, and she became a really good friend, and she would write me letters and just send me like little styrofoam balls and like here's something you could do to make a you know, little puppets and very supportive of, of, of me getting involved in doing marionettes. And then also my parents took me to um, a day of puppetry through the Puppet Guild in Detroit. And um, I didn't know about the guild at all at that point. And I just saw this thing in the newspaper, you know, it was, it was during January, you know, so during a blizzard, like in normal Michigan. And uh, my parents didn't want to drive me, you know, schlep me down to Detroit to do, you know, see this day of puppetry. But, you know, it's funny that you could you could never do that these days, but they dropped me off at this, you know, this thing left me be there all day, you know, with these strangers. And and uh, I was like, I could not believe that these people like, you know, did this and they had all these you know exhibits and they were showing little workshops. And and I'm, I remember I remember uh, they had this very cool clown marionette that they were raffling off. So I had, you know, my parents gave me like $20 or something. And I took all of my money and just like put all these raffle tickets in there. You know, they could see how I, how I wanted this. And it was, you know, later I knew it was a Bob Brown uh, clown marionette that he made for the for the guild. But I happened to win, you know, the clown marionette. I was able to take it home, you know, and I was like, you know, stick a fork in me. I'm done, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm good for life, you know. But I met at that day, I met uh, Nancy Hank. She was part of the guild. And um, and then also after the kind of guild per- performances and the kind of small workshop things, they had a performance of uh, at the Detroit Institute of the Arts, which is across the street. And so we went over there and we got to see the Wayne Martin puppets. And that was the first time I ever saw Wayne Martin and met him for the first time. We were still friends to this day. And uh, so that was my kind of first foray into real seeing professional shows you know all these people can do it for a living and they're actually uh you know you can have training and there's an organization to to be involved with for sure yeah yeah now you've made your career working with marionettes what is it about marionettes that appeal to you over say other forms of of puppetry i always really cared for marionettes because they're a lot harder to deal with to be honest with you yes they are they're they're (laughs) You know, they just, you have nothing to work with really other than, you know, gravity and hopefully something works in your favor. And I really like that challenge of having to be able to work for these things to, to do well. You know, there's a reason why we spend so much trying to make them look good just walking across the stage, you know, which is the simplest thing in the world. So I really like the kind of challenge of that. Um, it's, it's, 
It's also um, I, because I did get my first puppet as a marionette. I think I'm just kind of, and we do some kind of um, styles of other things in our some of our productions. Like we do have some rod puppets and some some hand puppets and just some simple little hand ballets that we do in our educational shows to kind of show easy ways to make uh, puppets today, so kids don't have to make hard marionettes. But uh, I don't know. It's just I always really appreciated marionettes. Yeah, I was watching clips of. Um of uh you performing with the stanford symphony mm -hmm. and uh one of the pieces was uh hand puppets you know like uh, the candy monster i think was the the sure. name of it so um but it was interesting to see that form of puppetry too and and you're exposing everybody to that as well yeah we try to do a little bit of everything um because tony obano was one of my mentors you know we, he does like to have some hand puppet things in, in the marionette show, which I always really like. So we're trying to have something on one side of the stage and something on the other side of the stage, uh, either either hand ballet or a simple, uh, you know, a conductor that we do in our variety show or something like that. Or we always like to try to include something like that. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned going to the Day of Puppetry, um, but in 1993, you actually performed at the National Festival, right? And you were only 16, if I, if I, if those facts were correct? Uh... I'm not going to do math this morning. I'll <laughs> That's take fine. You don't have to. Yeah. yeah. When I moved to California in 1989, uh, um, we moved here and because I was involved with the Guild of Detroit for a short time. And they said, oh, you're going to California. You need to go meet with Lady Schubert at the, the San Francisco Guild and she'll be help you out there. And so I, you know, said in my notes, hey, I'm coming to town, you know, I want to be involved. And she said, OK, well, they're having the uh, puppet fair at Children's Fairyland that summer. So she invited me to that. So that was my first time actually coming to Children's Fairyland and meeting the Guild. And they were having, you know, very big and uh, showing of exhibit there and and they were doing the the fairyland show and a bunch of other shows you know around the park you know i was just like i couldn't believe that this huge art form was just being showcased uh, at, at fairyland so I, I was definitely hooked when i when i moved to california excellent uh yeah well i have a couple questions about uh, fairyland and stuff because um uh, and some of the people who work there, because I know it's a it's a great place. And we've talked about it on the show before. Um, I did want to touch on your college uh, experience because you studied music in college. And since both music and puppetry are art forms, are there any lessons you learned from studying music that you applied to your puppetry? Yeah, I, well, I also started playing drums when I was about six or seven at about the same time that I uh, got my toy marionette. So I had played my whole life um, in you know school bands and things like that. And then when I would, went to uh, high school, well, I was really involved in the marching band and all the drum and all the programs of, of music there. And actually, um, my music teacher in high school, she figured we had an aptitude for, you know, being a good musician. So she would often invite people who were kind of juniors and seniors to perform in the local musical theater company in Walnut Creek. And so um, she had me do that. And I, my first production that I ever played, you know, I kind of there's always been these things in my life which I've kind of done, you know, professionally before I've done the other work as kind of I got involved doing, you know, playing, you know, uh, shows uh, every night of the week, uh, uh, you know, getting paid to do that. So I was kind of, you know, I've kind of had these great ex people showing me that, you know, you can you have some aptitude to do this. You should get involved in doing this professionally. So. Um, we started doing a lot of musical productions and I was playing, you know, every night of the week. And so I was always doing puppetry at the same time. I always loved the art form and I knew that I would never not do it in my life. Um, so because of that, I had to be able to learn how to build quickly, um, especially when I was in college and I would kind of come home for the weekends. I could build puppets a lot faster and, you know, so I could, you know have them to use with my life. Uh, so I kind of developed um, a building process of kind of carving styrofoam and then wrapping that in masking tape and then coating that um, in plastic resin. The same kind of material we use today, casting puppet parts, but it's kind of like a candy coating on a puppet show. So it's very lightweight, but it's also very strong and you can sand it. So I kind of developed quick ways of making marionettes over the years. And when you were in college, did you take any, not that music classes aren't performance classes because they are, but yeah. did you take any sort of like acting or, or movement classes uh, or did, is that performing just come naturally to you? Well, I, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do, to be honest with you. I knew I would be doing puppetry of some form, um, but I didn't feel like I should go to university just for for puppetry. Um, I went to a conservatory of music in Stockton at the University of Pacific. And so 
because there's a conservatory, it's very intensive of you're just doing music. But because their program's a little bit um, unique because it's connected to a university, you have to take regular classes there. So um, you're just taking your kind of regular, you know, English and math and stuff like that. But I would also take uh, theater classes um, at, at their technical theater stuff. So we, we build sets and and um, things like that, building props and things like that for them. But that, but because I was building and working so much, doing music, you know, every day and every night, and then coming coming home and you know playing, gigging around here in the Bay Area, you know, every weekend. It's it's kind of the reason that I get really got burned out after college and needed to kind of say, okay, am I going to do puppetry or am I going to do music? Um, and I could, you know. There's a much more niche market uh, doing puppetry than there is being, a, you know, a really good show drummer. So I kind of had to make a hard choice and kind of not put that side of myself, you know, away for the for the time being. Looking back on it now, do you feel that you made the right choice? Are you happy with the choice that you made? I'm very happy with the choice. I do miss it very much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have great friends that, you know, are part of your life there. I mean, you um, because you spend a, it's a weird, it's a, it's, it's, a, and, and I didn't answer that question before, but you know, I have, you have great building of skills as a musician as the same as puppetry. It's the same thing. It's just different tools. That's all it is. Uh, but you know, you, you have, you know, a great person who's going to be yelling at you, who you need to be better and, you know, trying to bet you better. It's the same skills as, and, you know, hopefully you have a good director who can kind of mold you and <laughs> shape you into a great uh, performer. It's, it's the same things really. Well, and I read uh, in one of the, the I, I think interviewer a quote from you in in one of the things I read, uh, you you said, and it's very true that like puppetry is like playing an instrument because you do have this sort of instrument that you have to manipulate, and especially marionettes. I mean, I, you know, I look at marionettes kind of the same way I would look at an oboe or something like that. I would yeah. be like, I have no idea where to even start on this. Yeah, I was kind of, when kids ask that question, I kind of equate that to them. Like, it's just like playing a musical instrument. You have to pick it up. You have to be very bad at it. You have to sit in front of a mirror. You sit in front of a video camera and you have to watch yourself and then you'll get better. And that's that's all you have to do. It's just repetition, you know. Or sometimes kids want to say, well, how can you be so good? How can you be so good? I'm like, well, there's only three reasons you have to be good. It's just practice, practice, and practice. <laughs> and that's it. Yeah. Well, uh, you've worked with some uh, just incredible mentors, a, a few of which you, you've mentioned already. And I may have these a little bit out of order, but I would love to talk about about all of them. Um, but you spent some time. Well, you mentioned him earlier. So let's start with Tony Urbano. Uh, how did you get involved working with Tony? Um, the first time I met Tony, um, I knew who he was, obviously, through the Guild and kind of seeing Fairyland and knowing his history backstage. Um he came down to do, I think the guild was turning 50 maybe, and it was maybe around 91 or two. Um, and he came down to do, they, had, they were kind of like having a formal dinner thing um, and they were having a few performances and he was kind of the closer of the, of the little evening. And um, it was being hosted by Michael and Valerie Nelson at the time who were the president. And uh, they said, oh, we need you to, we need somebody to have backstage who can hold Tony's puppets because he didn't bring a rack. He just brought these two acts, you know, with him. And he's just going to do this thing. Can you come hold these things back there? I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll hold his puppets and I'll hold his puppets. You know, it's just like 12 year old. And, and so I was holding these puppets and, you know, he did his acts and then he did his little, you know, roller skating bear and his little Della Reese puppet. And, and so he was just very appreciative and, you know, I got to meet him there and that was the first time I had met him. Um, and then when he was doing a thing at the 93 festival, he did this huge extravaganza as the closing act of the puppet festival. And um, it was being held at the Palace of Fine Arts in San Francisco, which is huge, you know, palace of, you know, red velvet. It's this, this luscious um, theater. And um, they needed a few people to uh, help carry puppets on during the stage. They were doing this big production number of Candide, the Overture of Candide, which he, it's a, it's a piece he had done from the 60s, but it's this, you know, if you ever knew the Candide Overture, it's this huge dramatic piece of music and he does it, you know, full from 
start to finish. And it's just basically the credits for the whole production. It has these, it's a big, very big Victorian, you know, big wigs and big costumes. And it has, you know, costumes by Francis Osnowitz and wigs by this. And, you know, this big dramatic thing of music and puppets and things. And it's gorgeous. And he needed people to kind of help carry puppets off after they're done on stage and kind of be taken backstage. So I kind of helped him with that and met him that time too. And, and just, uh, he sent a really nice thank you note and kind of sent him a whole packet of photographs and uh, of PR, you know, eight by tens and of his, his puppets and himself, you know. So I, that's the, the second time I had met him and we kind of started corresponding and he was doing another festival down in Los Angeles a number of years later. And um, he was doing a, another piece there, another performance. And we kind of met backstage and we we're like, okay, well, if you ever need somebody, um, <laughs> I want to work with you. So please, uh, please keep me in mind. So that's how I met him. And did you, did you wind up working on cruise ships with him? We did. I went down and auditioned for him. I spent about two days auditioning for him. And he taught me his Break Apart Skeleton Act, uh, one of his very standard um, Tony acts of these uh, tandem break apart uh, skeletons. And so, uh, you know, I spent the two days working on the routine and we found that we had a really great, you know, part of the, you know, the you know, part of the audition process with anybody is, you know, not just how good you are with puppets, but how good you are with that as a person. And cause you're going to spend a lot of time with them off stage and off stage, you know, you know, spending a, sharing a cabin with them on a cruise ship. So we had a really great uh, rapport together and I, I found that I, I don't know, I, I always found that I could do things pretty quickly and easily um, as a puppeteer. But then when we were kind of working, it's it's funny when somebody else kind of points those things out after something that you don't really understand yourself, but they're like, oh, you pick up on things really quickly and you can take direction and you can kind of move and do different things. I was like, okay, I guess that's that's a good thing, I guess. So, but we had our we had a really good, uh, great audition, and then we decided to start working together. Um, we started working on the show, and I would kind of go down to Los Angeles and uh, camp out in his guest room and uh, for months, and we were kind of working on the puppets and everything like that. And at the same time, he was working on um, Men in Black 2 at the time, so he was kind of back and forth from the studio. And at the same time, we were kind of working back and forth, and I would come down for a few weeks to a month or two, and then... 9-11 happened and it was kind of just, you know, threw up everything and, uh, you know, nobody really knew what was happening, especially not in the cruise ship market at that time. And when we first actually started doing shows on ships together, you know, we were going down to Australia with it for the first time. And so for a number of years, we were kind of work um, on short stints uh, around the world because Tony had been doing ships with him and Tim Blaney, but because he had been doing it for so many years and he was a very highly rated performer, he could do and go wherever you wanted to. So if people, they said, you know, if you if there are ships that you want to go on to, you know, just let us know and we'll make our schedule available for you too. So there was a world cruise that was offered to him down in Australia. So we went down there and spent a spent uh, about a week and a half touring around Australia. So that was our first time going on cruises together, which was great fun. And we kind of did off and on for about three or four years. And about the biggest stint we did was about three months together around Asia and um, about a month around China. So it was a great learning experience for, for sure. Yeah, it's always fun to get paid to also travel, to also do puppets. It's a, it's, it's a fun time. It is, it is. I'm really, really glad I did it. And I love the experience and I love working with Tony. Uh, but I'm also really glad I'm not doing cruise ships because... I mean, it's it's fine when you're there, but as there is anything in life and theater, you know, the hardest thing is really getting your stuff to, to where you're going. And, you know, you can't take marionettes all that compactly, you know, even if you're working small and compact, compactly, they're just large. There's, right. there's no way around it. Right. So. And especially after 9-11, where, you know, you couldn't bring large cases on the plane and, you you know, it's also hard to ship things and you they're out of your hand for weeks and weeks. And so it's a little tricky to do with Marianne, for sure. Yeah. Well, you also, uh, in addition to working with Tony, you uh, spent some time at the Bob Baker Marionette Theater as well. Right? I did. You no, know, when I moved here um, and was involved with Children's Fairyland, I was kind of um, apprenticing with... Um, Lewis Malman and, and Randall Metz very closely, and um, Randall would kind of take me around to, um, you know, different shows that he was doing on the road. Now, kind of just help carry stuff around and uh, unbag stuff. And he, because uh, Randall went was apprenticed 
with uh, Bob Baker as well. And um, Bob was up here performing at the Solano County Fair one summer, and he's always brought me along to see Bob perform. And that was, you know, amazing to meet him and uh, to meet with Tom Ray, who's performing with as well. And to got to know them and really, really incredibly sweet people. And then I would kind of go and every time they would come to the summer up here to the Bay Area or the Calistoga Fair or anything like that, uh, I would kind of come and see them and I would kind of like, hey, you want to come over to dinner over at my parents' house, you know? <laughs> and so Bob and Tom would come to trek, you know, from Marin or something over my parents' house and, and they would kind of come over for dinner, you know? It was really, really a great honor that they would kind of do that and uh, um, kind of show them what I'm working on, you know? Like, hey, here's this thing here and I'm trying to make this little, you know, little head. And it was like, oh, it's not really, a, you know, kind of animal you're kind of working on, you know? But it was... They were really great supportive people. And then when I graduated high school, I decided I was going to go down to Los Angeles during the summers and go work for Bob. And so I would kind of uh, work in the sh theater um, in the morning doing the shows. And then I also worked in the workshop building the Disney marionettes and um, got to really know Bob that, that way and really closely with them. And he obviously knew that I had an aptitude and was really interested in puppets, not just you know, somebody off the street. And so he'd always bring in these really art, early, beautifully carved things that he had made, you know, which just not, things that weren't really for the show, but just, you know, show, things that he had worked on when he was a lot younger and these gorgeous puppets. And then at that same time, he also, one day he said, oh, we're going to go see this Russian theaters in town. Let's go see this Russian theater. And, you know, everybody went to this. So I had no idea what it was. And I didn't know that it was you know, a Brotsoff theater touring here in Los Angeles. And he was like, to, it was like a, this magnificent production of Rod Puppets. You know, it was such a mag, magical evening uh, seeing these shows. So, yeah, we stayed in touch for, you know, a very close relationship over the years. Also, I think, and I guess this this is uh, the same. Well, I'm, it's the same with all three of these, with uh, working on cruise ships with Tony and working at Bob Baker and then also Children's Fairyland is – really to you know you mentioned earlier practice 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 and just doing those shows show after show after show is such a great way to build up your skills and make you a better performer absolutely i mean there are times that we normally what we do now is when we are doing kind of a longer tour of kind of the las vegas libraries that we do every summer that's a great time where we have like you know 15 16 shows in a week and you can do it over and over and really get things uh, refined and even though we've done you know over the years you still have a really great, especially it's funny now during COVID where we weren't doing things live so much and then coming back to it and kind of relearning the production and, you know, it's a puppet that you've been working with, you know, for decades and you're like, A, you have an appreciation for what you can do and you kind of want to refine and do things like, oh, hey, it's never really worked out well. I'm, I've kind of had this really sloppy walk and I'm going to really, you know, try to make it better and, you know, re, you know, like you're working with a puppet for the first time again. So it's, it's kind of fun. Yeah, discovering new things too, I'm sure. Absolutely. And I wanted to talk about Children's Fairyland because you talked about uh, that was one of the first places you went to when you got to the Bay Area. And it really is just a just an amazing place. Um, uh, did you wind up working there? Were you Did you perform there? I did perform there. Um, I would always hang around there. And uh, my parents have a, a boat, or they used to have a boat in the Bay Area. And, uh, and so I'm not a boat person at all. So they would oftentimes when they would go to the boat on the weekend and they would drop me off at Fairyland and then pick me up after the park is closed when they were done <laughs> sailing for the day, which was great fun. And I didn't want to be out on the boat anyway. So <laughs> I would kind of spend time there and go watch the shows. And sometimes, you know, Lewis or Randall kind of let me do what, a, you know, an ancillary character that would just kind of come on and off you know, or something like that. But it really, when I was uh, involved in the guild here, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's a really close knit group of people that, you know, are still friends to this day, of course. And, you know, people that I met on that day, you know, like Mike Nelson and Leo Armstrong, you know, they were just showing their things on the day. But, you know, it's, it's a very close knit group of people that I, that I love being meeting. Yeah. Well, you've 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 got to work with all these amazing, you know, like very early in your career, you work with Bob Baker, you work with Tony Urbano and uh, Randall and Lewis. Uh, do you feel it's important for puppeteers who are just starting out is to is to seek out these people and find these people who you can work with and learn from? Absolutely. You know, I'm still very much a letter writer to people and I love writing to people. And it, it's funny, uh, uh, you know, it's like, it's still, I, and I'm also a big fanboy of being a collector. You know, it's like, I reach out to people and it's like, I love your work and I want to have one of your pieces in my collection. You know, it's like, that's the way you build relationships with people and also 
you know, people want to have their work appreciated. You know, there's a reason why you hopefully you're spending so much time sanding on things while your fingers are bleeding out there. Right? <laughs> hopefully in 50 years, somebody else is going to appreciate that work. Yeah. When I was, uh, we had a, a, a regional festival at UC Berkeley, I think in 91. And um, I wasn't performing. I was just, you know, going to attend the festival and um, it was really great fun. And uh, there was a guy there who was, doing his, a late night cabaret show and he he did had mar did marionettes in san francisco at this uh this gay club called uh finocchio's which isn't there anymore but he had a you know a, a purely adult cabaret show that he did with all, all marionettes and it was a really funny thing and he he just needed some about you know some, some person to help these puppets you know get off on stage and and uh and to take off the puppets and stuff like that and so i said i'll do it you know i'll help you out and he's like okay you need some help and all right and so you know i could see my big eyes and he's like okay so i you know helped him bring out it i won't tell you what we his puppets were but some of them like he had a big fairy puppet that kind of came out and sang and uh in his act he also had a um a nixon and drag you know with a feather boa sitting on a piano singing i did it my way you know and, <laughs> and heels and funny things like that and uh he had a couple of tony's acts that he copied like his break apart skeleton and his opera singer so um, I got to know him over the years and even though he was doing this, these adult shows and he was very supportive. He kind of came to my first show at children's Fairyland and kind of see me a few times over the years, you know, but uh, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's great fun seeing your, seeing your friends being supporting you here for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's a, just a great learning experience. Just even sitting, watching, you know, if all you're doing is holding a puppet, uh, it's a great learning experience just to sit there and watch somebody else perform mm -hmm. and you may learn a few things as well. Yeah. And he was very open. He's like, you know, here's my puppets, you know, he was just to let you play with them and try them out and everything, which is always great. And which, which I'm the same way, you know, I like, you know, not, not the public, but, uh, but, uh, but pup puppeteers and professionals. Absolutely. I want people to try them and, um, and hopefully appreciate the work that we put into them and everything. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm the same way. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the work you put into them. Uh, you build all the puppets for your shows. Can you kind of walk us through, you know, it doesn't have to be detailed, but like sort of the process, like uh, how does a puppet go from, you know, just an idea to being in the show? Sure. Um, well, right now we're building a brand new production of Jack and the Beanstalk. And um, we normally it takes us about a year to make a show from start to finish. Um, that's making, you know, the puppets from scratch and all the controls. And uh, we usually use kind of a, a raised platform stage that's kind of repurposed for every production that we we do. So it's kind of a, a keystone and everything else kind of fits in around that in most of our productions that we do. So right now, when we're kind of working on something new, like last year, we were kind of talking about doing some Japanese stories in the or something. All the, uh, we kind of talked about working on uh, Charlotte's Web in the past. You know, we, it's one of those things we pick it apart everything good about it everything bad about it what you what you want to see out of it visuals you know that that really just speak to you you know problems doing with marionettes you know we have to have size and scale you know you can't build a huge production um our productions are even though we do theaters and you know larger venues like that but oftentimes we're performing in people's living rooms so it has to be large enough to fit in a theater impressive enough at, you know uh, in a npr you know when we're doing an assembly but also be small and compact enough that it's travelable. I mean, all of our productions um, are designed to be built in two cases. So it's actually a very Jim Gamble stage. Uh, you know, it's got a box on the bottom with wheels and a box on top. It doesn't have, and oftentimes we kind of use different combinations of that, but it's kind of, we kind of have really found that's a great tool to have all of our productions being these two cases. So back in our workshop, there's actually just stacks of cases, cases, cases of all the different productions. And we just, whatever we're doing that day and we don't take them out and throw them in the van. So when we're building a new show, uh, we pick it apart, you know, all the good things, all the bad things. And oftentimes we will, when we're trying to work on story and kind of just scenes or, you know, what kind of characters you want to use, we'll just use big pieces of cardboard and have this is, this is, you know, this is mother goose here. And we're going to have here, here. And okay, we're going to have Mary and her little lamb here. And we're going to kind of have those things. And we just, we actually build the entire production out of cardboard and we can actually hang them on hooks if we when we get to that point if we get that far into the production of okay this is going to go for fed and we, we like this idea and we can see okay and and also physically with marionettes especially the show right now is actually going to be a one-person production or a two-person production some of our shows are only one person 
some are shows are most of them are only two people, but some of them are either or because just the way the thing life works nowadays, you can't be always relying on having a second puppeteer to help you out. So because you have that physical, you know, limitations of how far can I reach that I can hang a big puppet over there and on this side too. And while I'm on stage, you know, working Jack, I, can I reach around here and get the mother and bring her on there? So what we do is we kind of just mess around, get a little pieces of wood and hang them up there and clamp them in place and hang some curtains over the top of them and put some hooks and we just move it around. So like, well, this works well, but it has really terrible sight lines. So like we're working on now, we had to figure out how can we have a beanstalk come, you know, if you have a production with a closed proscenium, you know, having a beanstalk come out of the ground and go to the top where you can't see it, it's really easy. But when you don't have a top and you're working open face like we do, where is that beanstalk gonna go? Where's it going right. to come from? We had to figure out where it could be on the stage where it's close enough that Jack could climb up the beanstalk, but also be far enough away that you can see it across the stage and not be hidden by us. So those are really just the things we just do with cardboard and it's just easy to change and you're not, you're not married into anything. Then we kind of write the script after that. Um, and then we kind of go through the script again with the uh, cardboard pieces of cardboard, get them out there and just move them around and into different positions um, and then we'll start building the puppets off of those drawings. And um, sometimes we'll be working with an artist rendering if we're not doing it ourselves. In this production, we're having um, our friend Elizabeth Luth, Luth design the characters. She designed a couple of our other productions and lots of our puppets in our show. I love her work. Um, she designed our Carnival of the Animals production and our Frog Prince production. She'll do character drawings of each of the characters and also kind of rough just black and white outlines of the character kind of the kind of silhouette of each of the character uh, and then i'll transfer those into blueprints i'll draw blueprints for each of the characters you know front view side view all the marionettes and then we'll take all of our patterns from from those two blueprints and so when i'm working on something or when sam's working on something we know exactly the right size it has to be that we that we have to make sure that's all the right uh, measurements and everything um and then we generally, what we generally do is when we build most of the puppets uh, and they're done, we'll get out the stage again, get you know where all the hooks are before we start recording any of the dialogue or any of the you know, assembling any of the soundtrack. And we'll go through the thing again, and we just go through the script, you know, scene by scene. Okay, this scene was going to work. We need to you know have a little bit more time here. This dialogue doesn't really work, you know, with these two puppets, or you know, there's just logistic things that don't work pop properly when the puppets are done. And then we generally um, get actors and we record all the dialogue and then we have assembled the music. Sometimes it's kind of, we want to use kind of traditional music like in our Aladdin production. Sometimes you kind of have somebody compose music for our Mother Goose stories or kind of depends where we find music depending on what we're doing. Um, and then we have that all edited together into a soundtrack. And so it just played straight through. Then when we start rehearsing with it, there's still going to be a lot of time switching between, you know, oh, I need a little bit more time here to, you know, we do, because our productions are pre-recorded, um, you can have to, you know, shift some scene change stuff sometimes if there's not enough time there to do that or things like that, uh, uh, a little kind of fine tuning of each of the productions. And then it's usually done. Yeah. Well, and, and you know, it certainly shows because the, the clips I've seen online, the, the shows are just a lot of fun and they have a great look to them. Uh, a lot of your shows are based on, as you mentioned, Jack and the Beanstalk and Aladdin and the Frog Prince. Um, is it like fairy tales and stuff? Is that where you draw a lot of inspiration from for your shows? Uh, it depends. Sometimes we're trying to do a certain focus or character. You know, we were trying to have something for little younger audiences. We kind of developed our Mother Goose Land production for younger kids. And even though we get booked at, you know, all age groups, but our stuff is a little bit more sophisticated. Um, it's not really small kids, you know, preschool age stuff. Um, uh, so we kind of developed Mother Gooseland specifically for those younger audiences. Um, but yeah, uh, uh, one of our, my, one of my favorite productions that we have is called uh, Carnival of the Animals. And so we actually do three stories. We do the Ugly Duckling, we do the Tortoise and the Hare, and the Three Little Pigs. And it's all done to music. There's no dialogue at all. And each of the three stories are all intertwined with each other. So it kind of starts out as having, you know, one story, then the next story, then the next story. And, but then the pigs start kind of appearing in with this character. And the, and they kind of, you know, you're like, why are these characters kind of overlapping? And, and it's all done to music. So it's, um, 
and it's done to the Carnival of the Animals Sanson score. So we've also, that's one of the things we've done as a, as a symphonic collaboration. We developed that one for the, to do with the Diablo Symphony originally. So we, we had to be able to change, we couldn't change too much of the music. We did move some of the music around, some of the movements and repeat one of them. But other than that, it's the complete uh, score that we do. So that's a, that's a production I'm really happy with. Yeah, I love the uh, Big Bad Wolf puppet in that. It's it's just a great look. That's Elizabeth Luce as well. She's yeah, she's a gorgeous designer, and uh, <laughs> he's he's definitely the favorite of the show for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's a really great puppet. You also speaking of puppets, you also have a show that you do called The Art of the Puppet. That's a little bit different from these other shows. Could you talk a little bit about that show? Sure. We had to have a you know an educational show so that. People kind of see some of the, uh, even though after every performance, we always do a QA and a and we kind of do a show and tell if we're kind of doing a library show, something that's a little more um, up close. It's We can't really do show and tell with uh, school assemblies, but uh, for, for more intimate shows that we do a uh, show and tell afterwards. But our Art of the Puppet, we kind of do a little bit of a hand puppets, shadow puppets, rod puppets, a little bit of everything. And we, after each of the acts, then we kind of talk about each of those pieces and kind of introducing different styles and, and things like that. So um, one of those things that we kind of developed for that show is we do have, do have a hand ballet. Um, we have a couple of different versions of it, um, which are one of the fun things that we like to do in the show is, is just a real simple, you know, styrofoam ball on your finger. And we have a, the first act we did was a, a snow act. It's a, we use a piece of Tchaikovsky symphony. And so it's just a little boy and a, uh, you know, a brother and sister kind of having a snowball fight and making a snowball turning into a big snowman. And then the, the little boy pushing the snowman onto the, you know, the sister and having it, you know, pop off in his head. So completely done with music, no dialogue at all. Um, and we have a couple other versions of that where we kind of do a little storytelling with a piece called Ragtime, where we have a little dog, a man and his dog, and they kind of throws a Frisbee and he throws a ball at the dog and then he... All just done with a little, you know, stick on our finger like that. So we always explain before we do that in, in our educational shows how that's done so they can do the, the piece themselves. Yeah. Oh, that's great. When you're when you're booking shows, how do you go about getting bookings? Do you is it at this point for you now word of mouth or do you go to I know that there's library booking conferences and things like that? There are, and we do perform at those showcases from from time to time. Um, but we have been doing it for so long that most people know us. Um, we will kind of showcase if we're doing something new. We have new production. Um, usually, we build a new show about every three or four years, um, and then it takes about a year to make that from start to finish. So um, we don't build stuff all the time when we're not building the new production. We'll be kind of rebuilding old puppets in the show. Like if you have an old variety puppet that you've been using since forever, you know, we'll kind of rebuild those things and kind of add a few new acts into a couple of our variety shows. Uh, Cause we have a few variety shows like our Halloween show and our Christmas show, which we do ad nauseum during December and, uh, you know, also a vaudeville show. So we kind of add new things to that over the years. So it keeps it up and keeps it all fresh. That's right. I asked you if you, you could be on the show in December and you were like, not in December. Contact me <laughs> after December. Yeah, even, even with COVID last year or the last month, it was still quite busy, for, which is, yeah. thank God. But yeah. Well, doing all these shows, traveling around, I mean, you've talked about, um, you know, how you fit everything into two cases and, uh, you know, what What do you think is the biggest lesson you've learned uh, going out and, and performing these shows like all over the place, you know, just doing so many shows? You know, it's one of those things you don't ever think about or plan on what you're doing, but it's just, as I said, we do, you know, carry everything in these little two cases. And especially when we're, you know, driving around San Francisco and you've got to lug stuff up a hill and, you know, it has to be all small and compact. You know, we'd usually take one load into the car and, and take it in. And, uh, you know, it's going to fold out to this big erector set and it looks like a really impressive thing. And so, I always, sometimes people comment, clients always say like, oh, you know, we don't have to, when, when we have you coming to our event or, you know, as a, when we book you, we, we don't have to worry about you. We know that you're going to show up on time and you're going to do a professional show and you just, you know, the, the audience likes to the show, the, they like you, they want to talk to you afterwards and have that great um, interaction after the performance. And so it's not something we ever really set out to do, you know, it's, it's kind of a hard thing to say, but it's, we always want to be just to do a really professional show and have it be really slick and, you know, polished. I mean, there's lots of bad puppet shows out there, but we really don't, we really strive for 
um, you know, having the best quality stuff that we can, you know, not just the puppets, but the performance as well. Yeah. One thing I thought was interesting on your website, I was looking through the frequently asked questions and uh, you, you really have kind of strict guidelines about performing outdoors. Uh, and it says like, you know, no grass, no dirt, no hills. And I'm just wondering if there was a story behind why that went on there or it's just like, no, we don't want to get the puppets dirty and we don't, you know. Yeah, we don't. Well, A, we don't perform on the ground just in general. We do have a, a, a birthday show that we do. It's it's smaller. Um, that doesn't have a raised stage on it. We do that on the floor because we are performing in people's living rooms. So we had to have a smaller stage, just really compact. But in general, we can't set up on on grass or dirt because our stage has legs on it. And so when we stand on it, it's going to sink in there to begin with. Right. And it's, it's a very bizarre thing. Not standing straight flat on a surface is very disheartening when performing for half an hour. It's just like a little bit of a tilt. And it's like, oh, I feel like I'm out. All the puppets are falling over, you know, it's just like, <laughs> it's, and you, you have to do, you know, performing, you have to do shows, you know, where you can. So you're going to be in a little angle sometimes. And you're like, just like, I feel like I'm going to fall off the stage. I'm going to fall off the stage. I'm going to fall off the stage. And it's <laughs> like one of those weird things. So. It's just one of my my rules because oftentimes they're just like, okay, you show up for the gig and they're like, oh, here's the grass. And you're like, yeah, right. no, here says my contract, no grass, no hot side, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, you have to spell those things out. It's good Absolutely. To, and even good and, to and, uh, you have to be, the, the thing about being professional about it, you're like, okay, well, let's find a spot that we can actually do it over here instead of like, no, this is my rules and I can't, you know, I'm not going to perform <laughs> without it. I'm going to be in my dressing room. No, you just have to like, okay, what's the best switching we can, you know, what's the best way we can, you know, make it look good. That's all I can Yeah. Do. Yeah. Because that's what everybody wants is a good show. Nobody. Absolutely. <laughs> Here's all these hurdles. Yeah. It's, it's my rule when it, after we're done setting up, it's a, my own, own little thing I like to do is I set up the show if we're in a theater, with, you know, for an assembly and then just go and leave and, you know, go to the bathroom or wash your hands and then come back in. And I always look at my stage and just with like a fresh eyes and be like, is, you know, if I move the stage curtains, you know, move them in a little bit better, it's going to look nicer for the audience when they come in. That's what their first impression to be, you know. Um, and nowadays, you know, there's so few puppet shows, you know, sometimes it's, this is not, forget, this is their first marionette show. This is their first puppet show. So it's better be a really, really good show. You know, you better put a lot of, you know, hard work and effort into that production. Yeah. Well, the other thing you offer on your website is actually restoration, where you uh, will help people restore puppets that they have. Um, how long have you been doing that? Um, you know, that's something that started many years ago when I first had a website um, in about 2000. And my first business partner, Michael, he made just a kind of a really simple page of just my collection of Pelham puppets. And it was just like a, pictures of each of them. And people would just found that page and just like, Oh, I have a, I have a thing, you know, can you restring it? I'm like, sure. I guess so. It, it wasn't something I ever set out to do. And they just kept sending more and more of those things. And I, okay, I guess I, I can do that as part of, as being a puppeteer. Um, nowadays it, it's happened a lot. Like I usually get one or two every week of people sending me puppets and um, people dropping them off who live here in the Bay area. But if they're too large, sometimes, um, like I had a woman last week had this huge French, uh, it was a very cool biplane, uh, you know, sculpture thing. You know, she had to drive it in her back of her car, you know, to drop it off so I could fix something. But it's, um, people send, send me things from all over the world. And uh, so I generally kind of fix it up, add new strings, you know, kind of depends on what the client wants to do with it uh, and then pack it up and send it back. Um, and I've kind of also done that with some um, museums around the country too. They have, you know, a collection of Bill Baird puppets and they'll have them sent to me and I'll fix them, just have them cleaned or just real carefully fixed, you know, however they need to be and they can back in on exhibit for a museum exhibit. I like also on that page, there's a great picture of just a bunch of marionettes thrown in a box that you just labeled like, this is not how you send puppets. What is, uh, I don't know how to put this, but like just this thing where you open the box and you're like, oh no, I'm going to have to work on this. Was there was there one project that was like that? Well, I mean, that picture that's on there is actually a real life picture that I got when, <laughs> when it was sent to me. It was just this jumbled mess. I'm like, I got to take a picture of this because, you know, it's just a crazy thing. So, yeah. uh, you know, oftentimes things do break. Um, I, I do fix a lot of... Um, Czechoslovakian marionettes, which are beautiful, but they're cast out of plaster of Paris. You know, it's a really cheap 
casting material and it's you can paint it and it looks nice but it breaks really easily so the limbs and the the joints on those things uh, break you know quite quite easily so i've done lots of those countless of those and uh, also lots and lots of you know indonesian thai and burmese marionettes so you know people they go oh, this is this fourth century marionette you know it's this great thing here you know it's like no, it was made last week and it's made to look old, but I'll happily restring it for you, you know, but it's, you have to have some, give them some perspective on, on things. And oftentimes I get people who clean out their attics, you know, and they're like, oh, especially grandparents had their toy as from their own, when they were a kid, they want to give it to their grandkid uh, as a Christmas present, or sometimes a spouse found something of theirs and they want to fix it up for a birthday present or something like that. So lots of those. Yeah. Well, it's a it's a great service, and I don't think a lot of you know. I think you see a lot of on the web, they'll build puppets for you, but restoration is is a unique thing that I haven't come across often. Yeah, and I like to. I'm a kind of a purist, and I like to. It's supposed to be an antique puppet, and it's supposed to look old. You know, so many people want restoration where it's like factory fresh paint, and it's going to be have the costume brand new and fresh. I'm like, I'm oh, happy to do whatever you like, but you know, it's like it's supposed to be old. It's supposed to yeah. have history. It's supposed to live the life. You know. Yeah. It's like that was that question about rebuilding the ship, right? Like, exactly. when, when is it a brand new ship? <laughs> well, in uh, 2021, you, along with Randall Metz, uh, wrote a great book called A Century of California Puppetry, How the West Was Strung. Um, and can you talk a little bit about the the idea to do that book and, and what it was like uh, putting that book together? Sure. Uh, Randall came to me and he had this idea of doing this uh, puppet history book. And I thought, thought it was a really, really great idea. He had already written a few of his fairyland puppet making books. And um, I said, sure, I'd be happy to help out and, you know, involved with uh, any anything I could. And so we kind of started off the, the pathway to making this book, which turned out to be a lot <laughs> bigger project, you know, for years and years of working on it. But uh we originally wanted to kind of have it be a beautiful kind of coffee table color photo, just a kind of a, a brief bio and a beautiful, you know, photo image. That was kind of the, what we were kind of thinking about when we went into this project, but, and we also knew that there was going to be a lot of problems, not being a dictionary or a Wikipedia with every person under the sun who ever, you know, slept in California, it was going to be involved. So it's like, you have to find some where you're going to pick people out there. And so we kind of started out with, a, obviously, the biggest list we could make of just anybody we could think of. And then we kind of narrowed it down to, okay, these are the people we're going to actually focus on and write about. Um, and then I kind of went along. Randall was kind of working on the text and the writing of it. And then I was kind of working on the photos and gathering all that, um, you know, from people who are still living and um, we kind of collaborated when we went through it. Um, and then when Lumen Code started, when he agreed to publish the book, he got, which was a great help to us because his, his long history uh, is being a California puppeteer as well. But he had, a, you know, some great insights of how we should maybe have people at the end of the chapters who weren't, weren't featured with the photos or we kind of have a little small bio. Um, but we still knew it wasn't going to be a list of everybody under the sun. So we had to make some hard you know, decisions of who was going to be involved and who wasn't. And it was also really, really important to me that it wasn't just about performers, that it was about artists. It was about ventriloquists and sculptors and, you know, stop motion and people who are builders in Los Angeles for the TV movie industry, you know, and people like me are just, you know, just plumbers and we just go out and do puppet shows all the time but it's we wanted to have a real and and also puppet theaters we wanted to especially feature puppet theaters that have been in the state well researching all these puppeteers and 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 seeing bios for all of them were there any sort of similarities where you're like oh that's a california puppeteer right there <laughs> like they have this trait yeah you know it's funny it's 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 definitely a journey you know people were not stagnant people being here in california they had to come here or you know be led through here to other places in the world uh, as performers um but uh it is funny it, writing about dead people is much much easier than working with people that are still living working on their bios i will say that but <laughs> that part of it if we had to do a history book again i'd be only if they're dead people <laughs> Well, I, 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 I'm honored that I was featured in the book and I'm alive. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. yeah. 
Uh, well, speaking of Randall, I, I asked Randall um, going into this, I was like, oh, I'm going to interview Kevin. And uh, I, I is there anything that I should ask about? And Randall said that I should definitely ask about uh, your experience on the gong show. So can you tell about being on the gong show? And, sure, and how that sure, went? sure. Uh, it, yeah. In, uh, in college, I built a, oh, I think they were having, uh, yeah, in 2000, they were having a cabaret late night kind of marionette show at the seattle festival in um, in 2000 and uh, or 99 so i was kind of asked to be part of the it was like jim gamble was hosting it and a bunch of different people from all over the world and uh you were just doing like 10 minutes a couple acts um and so i wanted to build something new and something special so i decided to build a, an old lady stripper for um uh, as a funny thing i thought was really funny so I built this old lady stripper. Her name is Helen Highwater. She's named after my grandmother, who's named Helen. And uh, it just went over really, really well. And it was just, you know, had a lot, you know, people seemed to be really responding to her. And so I I had saw something online that there was going to have um, auditions. You could submit tapes for the Extreme Gong Show on the Game Show Network. And so I submitted the the old lady and my, like my opera singer and a couple other things, but they wanted the old lady to come on there. So I, I went down there and filmed that in Los Angeles and won on the one, one, one thing. So she's <laughs> fun. And I really like her. We, we, we formed her a couple of years ago. Um, she, she, I'll just tell you what she has. She has like, she has a hula. She comes out walking really, really slow and she's, you know, she's can barely walk on the stage and she's got house slippers on and she's got, you know, a lay blue hair and you know, a lay and a lay around her neck. And then, uh, she kind of does start doing her, doing her hips moving. And then, um, eventually she gets faster and faster and then she takes off her, you know, grass skirt and then she's got bloomers on underneath there. And then she kind of dances around and then, and then she dances around some more. She takes off her, for seashells as a bra and then she throws those off stage and then she's got her boobs that hang onto her knees and then they, they <laughs> flop down and move them around. So, yeah, classy. Well, that's something you and I have in common. We were both on the Extreme Gong Show, except oh, I wasn't doing puppets. Yeah, it was back oh. when I was doing comedy, but it's, I don't think anybody remembered that show, but it's good to know, meet somebody else who went through that process. Yeah, I still have my tape on it. I'm like, yeah, it's, I, I forget about it every once in a while. I was like, oh yeah, it was a nice thing. <laughs> yeah. Well, as we wrap up here, I would love to ask if uh, if a puppeteer uh, is just beginning their journey with marionettes, where should they start, in your opinion? I, you know, I am a big fan of libraries. Um, I have a large puppet library of not just marionette books, but all puppet books and uh, of all things I can anything I can find, really. The great thing about, you know, working on cruise ships and just being traveling the world as it is. Always go to used bookstores. It's always the best thing to do when you're in some weird place. And like you're always in Australia and they have like the best puppet books in Australia because all the British people came down from Australia and they have these great collections of puppet books there. So um, I am a big proponent of uh, a puppet library. And um, and I think reaching out to other professionals and, you know, bugging the heck out of them and to let them, you know, <laughs> learn what what they can from them as, as I did and how people are very patient with you and like, okay, I'll teach, I'll show you this. Here you go. Here you go. And you go away. And, uh, and I think that's, that, that's what the best way. And I think you can really learn the craft the best way. That's great advice. Um, I love the used bookstore idea. It's uh, I've never done that and I should do that more. As we wrap up here, Kevin, I always like to ask what has been the highlight of your career so far? That's a good question. I don't really know. You know, uh, something that I think about quite often, you know, how little choices we make in the world, you know, really kind of change your traject trajectory in life. And, you know, the people that you're working with and you're working next to and you're working where you are in the world performing it. I always find that really interesting of, you know, it could be totally different. You had this ideas and where you're going to be going and had this, well, okay, I'm going to make this thing and I'm going to do this thing and I hope they go there. And, you know, this other thing happened and, you know, kind of led you in this different pathway and, and you had these other experiences, but with other people and, you know, had these other great experiences and productions and performances. And it's like, you can't really plan for too much in life. You know, it's just going to be, you got to, you know, hope for the best, to, you know, and go for the, you know, have the positive attitude of what you can do in life. And I always find that, 
you know, I have this great vision in my head of while I'm performing, sometimes going to the same place, you know, year after year. And, you know, you're, you're doing it in front of a different audience. You're doing a different show. You have a different person sitting next to you. You're in a different place in your life, you know, but you're doing the same thing you love and you're still going to be doing this till the rest of your life. And, you know, hold until you can't climb on that stage anymore. You know, I know it's going to be part of my life and I, and I really appreciate that. And I don't take that for granted. And I really, you know, push myself into trying to be as best as I can for today. Well, Kevin, I just thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us today. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me, Grant. I appreciate it. Big thanks to Kevin Menegas for the interview. For links to Kevin's social media, as well as to some of the things we talked about, check out the show notes for this episode, episode number 69, over at underthepuppet.com. Now it's time to announce the winner of episode 68's giveaway for a copy of Marionette's How to Make and Work Them by Helen Fling. The question was, what was the name of the chicken Drew Allison puppeteered in the Bojangles commercials? And the answer was, Little Guy. And the winner is David Akers. Congratulations, David. Your copy of Marionette's How to Make and Work Them is on the way. Now it's time for this episode's giveaway, and it was donated by our guest, Kevin Menegas. Not only are we giving away a Fratello Marionettes magnet, but also a signed copy of the book we spoke about in the interview, A Century of California Puppetry, How the West Was Strung. And that's not all. Kevin has also donated an unfinished marionette head and a set of marionette hands that were made for the Fratello Marionettes production of Jack and the Beanstalk. You can see pictures of this prize package in the show notes for this episode, episode number 69, at underthepuppet.com. To be entered to win, simply answer this question from the episode you just heard. What country did Kevin Menegas tour on his first job working cruises with Tony Urbano? When you find the answer, send it in an email to underthepuppet at gmail.com with the subject line giveaway and you'll be entered to win. All entries for this giveaway must be received by March 15th, 2022. The winner will be chosen at random from all correct entries and be announced on the April 2022 episode of the show. One entry per household. Good luck. This episode marks the start of our sixth year of Under the Puppet. Every month since March 2017, we've put out one, and sometimes two, new interviews with amazing puppeteers and puppetry professionals. And there are no plans to stop or take a break now. I would like to thank all our amazing guests over the past six years. I want to thank my editor, Stephen Staver, for always making the show sound so good. I want to thank all of the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons who truly make the show possible. And I want to thank you, our amazing listeners, for, well, listening and helping spread the word of Under the Puppet. I truly appreciate it. Thank you. This show is made possible by the Saturday Morning Media Patreon patrons, and Patreon patrons at the producer level who get a special shout-out are Vicki Sebring, David Akers, Tony Urbano, Kathy Crawford, Eve Cunning, and my great-aunt Dorothy Bachoco. To become a patron, visit patreon.com forward slash Saturday Morning Media. Well, that's going to do it for this episode of Under the Puppet. If you have questions, suggestions, or feedback about the show, call our voicemail line at 818-806-9604. Or click the Call the Show button in the free Under the Puppet app for iOS and Android. You can also send your questions via email to underthepuppet at gmail.com, or you can connect with the show on Instagram or Twitter by searching for Under the Puppet. And don't forget to tell a friend about the show. Thank you for six years, and thank you so much for listening. This episode of Under the Puppet was edited by Stephen Staver and featured music by Dan Rank. Help spread the word about the show by sharing your favorite Under the Puppet episode with a friend. Under the Puppet is copyright 2022 Saturday Morning Media, Grant Pachoco Executive Producer, all rights reserved. www.saturdaymorningmedia.com Under the Puppet proudly presents The Adventures of Timmy the Tooth Reunion. In this almost 90-minute video, you will hear great stories from the cast and crew who brought this amazing puppet show to life. Plus, you'll see never-before-seen artwork and exclusive behind-the-scenes video. Under the Puppet's Timmy the Tooth reunion is available right now at timmy.underthepuppet.com. You've been listening to Saturday Morning Media. Stay tuned. We'll be right back.